very, a very good evening and welcome to Let's Talk Politics. I'm your host, Eddie Lane. And of course, on this Tuesday, uh, Tuesday evening, we continue with our program to discuss the progress and development taking place under the People's Progressive Party uh, Civic Administration. And of course, to use the opportunity to respond to the lies and misinformation that are constantly coming out from the opposition. I have with me this evening to discuss some uh, very, very important matters, um, including what is happening over at the Ghana Elections Commission. Uh, says Gunraj says is a commissioner of the Ghana Elections Commission. Says good evening and welcome to the program. Good evening to you, Eddie, and good evening to all of your viewers. It's a pleasure to be here as usual. Thanks, uh, thanks so much, uh, says. Um, so over the past few um past few days we have been reviewing reflecting on the first year of the Irfan Ali led administration in office and like i have shared with 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 all those who appeared on the program i'll share with you that when you speak with the people of guyana and on a daily basis i know you interact with a lot of people i do the same you the sentiments that you hear from them are are, are kind of uniform in a sense but everybody just keeps saying fantastic job in 12 months what we have seen in 12 months uh, we haven't seen in five years comparing the dr finale led administration to the apnu fc administration which lost power um only last year so Generally, you know, Guyanese, when you listen to them, the sentiments you're getting is that they are satisfied with the work of the government. And I've been saying repeatedly that you have a government that, like I, I told um, the last guest on my show, Sanjeev, apparently the ministers of this government are allergic to their offices. So you don't find them in their offices sit down like the others in the previous administration. You find ministers in the field. And these are the sentiments coming from people that they have a government that is coming to them. So they are no longer making appointments to go and meet the ministers. The ministers are operating as though they are making appointments uh, to meet the people on a daily basis. The ministers of this government fanning out, meeting with people, listening to their concerns, and more importantly, reacting appropriately to ensure those concerns are addressed. Says you've been in the struggle. You've been in that struggle, not only the five months, but you've been in the struggle in the first instance to ensure GCOM was prepared for the elections, to ensure that as much as possible, uh, those attempts pre-elections to, 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 to set the stage to rig the elections were not successful. And of course, you were at the forefront in the battle uh, to preserve our democracy to ensure that the, the votes of the Guyanese people were counted and counted correctly and to ensure that ultimately the true winner, the People's Progressive Party Civic Administration, came out successful, reflecting one year later. Eddie, you have said a mouthful and I think you leave precious little for me to say uh, in response to your query. But that being said, um, when you asked me to reflect one year later, in effect, it should be a year and a half later, because this country was robbed of five precious months during perhaps one of the most critical times ever in our post-independent history. That is to say, in the height of a raging pandemic. And the less I say about how the pandemic was handled in the early stages, maybe is better, but it would be remiss of me if I did not in some small measure touch on what happened. It was a lopsided program guided by adhocracy, which attended the management of the COVID-19 pandemic, 
And I believe that today we are suffering some of the effects of that mishandling and that mismanagement. But that is for another, uh, that is perhaps for another day. What is more important is that economically and socially and in so many other ways, this country suffered from two issues at that time, uh, well, two major issues because there were many others prevailing as well. The usual issues that, that affect people. But you see, when those measures were implemented, it did, they did not take into consideration the effects. Persons who have to come out every single day and earn a livelihood. I have read statistics about domestic violence and interpersonal violence uh, increasing during that period, all having a root cause in perhaps the mismanagement of the pandemic. But then, like a breath of fresh air, and after a prolonged wait, and prolonged wait we'll obviously have to discuss again during, these, um, during the show later on, after that prolonged wait, finally there was a declaration, and President Dr. Mohammed Irfan Ali was sworn in on the 2nd of August. And as you have recognized, and I believe as this country and the world has recognized, President Ali spared no effort, did not skip a beat in getting right into attending to the needs of the populace. As the population expected, he endeavored from, the, from his opening speech and in every other interaction that he has had with the citizenry to have an open, approachable government. And so when you speak about ministers perhaps being allergic to their offices and are always out in the fields meeting with, interacting with, and listening to the issues that are affecting and that, and that afflict the citizenry of this country, and more importantly, as you have recognized, to address those issues in as timely and an, as an efficient manner as possible, then that shows that there is a, it is being, that effort is being led from the top right down. It is something that the president believes in. It is something that he has advocated for, and we see the effects of that. A year later, I believe I will be stifling my conscience if I tell you that we, have, we are living in a perfect country. But what I can recognize and recognize quite objectively is that the standard of living, the comfort level, the, I believe the emotional state of our citizens is in a better place. It has, it, has, it has enjoyed some degree of improvement. And this is in spite of the, the pandemic still prevailing. This is in spite of several other uh, intervening factors that we've had to grapple with, um, including but not limited to flooding, uh, some of which I may add, uh, is not only as a consequence of a natural occurrence, but which was exacerbated by the recklessness of uh, certain key players who for whatever, for whatever reason think it's best, best for our citizens to suffer rather than for all to enjoy the comforts of, that this land has to offer. But in addition to those issues, there are several global uh, issues that some of which are linked directly to the, uh, the global pandemic, and some of which um, are normal issues that, that perhaps have just come to the fore. And in that regard, I am, uh, I am referring, and I wish to point out, the most recent effort we see by the Air finale led administration to alleviate the effects of the global issues 
on our local population. That is to say the reduction uh, in the level of taxation uh, and the base price for freight uh, based on the, the pre-COVID values as opposed to the enormous and exorbitant values that currently prevail. The reaction, the, first of all, the recognition by President Irfan Ali that this is an issue. And secondly, to address it in a manner, it may not be perfect, but it is, the, it is what the government can do to ensure that relief is brought to its citizens. And I believe that has been a hallmark of this government over the last year. Listening to and reacting reacting positively to the needs of the of its citizens while dealing with all of the other issues which holistically at the end of the day are intended to benefit the citizens and and you know you know says i think you you the point that you conclude on and you put it quite nicely uh you know the, the response, I think that is the important thing for Guyanese people. Because you don't want ministers coming and listening to you. Uh, take your concerns and then you don't see them five years after. After five years, then you see them again in your community. You know, because they need your votes. The situation you know, is absolutely Eddie, different. Let me, let, me, let me jump in to say this. As is a matter, as is public knowledge, I have accompanied the president on uh, several outreaches to various regions of this country. We have dealt with, we have listened to persons with all kinds of issues, not dissimilar to what the ministers are doing on an almost daily basis in every single region, every single remote village, every single coastal village. Uh, every city center, everywhere, everywhere you turn, perhaps uh, you see a minister's presence, you see some senior official present listening to the needs of the uh, citizens. And I must confess, it is not the easiest thing to deal with all of those needs. Some of them, some of them you're hard pressed to even address. Some of them, they're not even issues that are at a governmental level, but you are forced to, because you are a responsible government, because you are a caring government, to deal with those needs of those persons to ensure some measure of relief is brought. It may not be per a perfect resolution, but at least there is some degree of comfort being afforded to, to those citizens, be it a group of citizens, a cl particular class of citizens, or specific individuals. And, and like you rightly said, you know, when, when you look across this country, every, as, as the saying goes, every nook and cranny, you can find a minister, a head of an agency, uh, somebody representing the government, listening to the concerns of the people and addressing them. And, uh, you know, I was making the point that you put it so nicely, the response, and the response is, is, is rooted in one fundamental sense, and that fundamental is, bringing relief to the people, ensuring that their lives are better, improving the lives, living condition, living standard of the people. I think that's the basis with which this government is operating for all Guyanese. And you spoke about the interventions in the field, but think about the interventions in dealing with the COVID, not only uh, from a medical perspective, but from a socioeconomic perspective of, as well where the government uh, rolled out a program to put monies in the hands of people during this pandemic so that they can at least, you know, pay their bills. The president I know announced when he just came in as well, uh, where he instructed the central bank to ensure that certain actions were taken for those who may have had mortgages, etc. cetera. Um, so there are a multiplicity of, 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 of approaches that were taken to ensure that the you can preserve to some extent the socio-economic well-being of the people. But even now, as we are, the president continue and the government continue to announce measures that are bringing benefits to the people. And just uh, yesterday, 
I, if I can find it, the, 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 the article here. Just yesterday, His Excellency instructed that the government forgoes $4.8 billion in revenue to cushion the rising international shipping cost. This is a serious issue. It's a major issue. And we recognize that, you know, <laughs> the, the, to ship a container maybe into the country was about 2,500 uh, US dollars. That has reached as much as about $15,000 in some cases, $20,000 in some cases. So that by itself led to price increases. We heard the cries about, about, about increase in, um, in cost of living, but the increase was mainly on the imported products. And we had a, a brief period of increase on local products as a result of the flooding. But these are the kinds of measures that are bringing the benefits and will bring the benefits to the people. Says I see you're eager to come in. But Eddie, Eddie, do you, you know, we can, we can perhaps make this most recent relief uh, by His Excellency, the topic of 10 programs and the impact it will have on the citizens of this country, the justification for it, the revenue loss that the state will suffer and all of those aspects of it. But you want me to tell you for me what I believe is perhaps the most important aspect of this relief as is disclosed in the press release from, this, from, the, uh, from the president. And it's contained in the last paragraph of the press release. And, and I will read it for you and for the benefit of our listening public. Government agencies will be tasked to ensure that such savings as are passed on to the consumer and not pocketed by unscrupulous importers. That, for me, I believe is a manifestation of exactly what I said earlier as to the mindset of the president, to bring relief directly to the citizens to bring relief directly to the citizens. And the fact that this is part of the mandate of government agencies, and no doubt ministers who uh, have those agencies under their purview, etc., to have those, to have that policed in that manner, to have that, to, to ensure that that, is, uh, that that benefit is passed on to the consumer, I believe for me, that is the most important aspect of this. You're right. You're right. Because implementing the measures or, or, or announcing the measure is one thing, is ensuring, like you rightly said, the benefits. And this, this is something clearly the president has been taking quite ser uh, seriously and taking personal interest in. And says this is just one in many. You know, we, we can go through so many interventions on a daily basis that are bettering the lives of people. The basic things, you know, you know, you have, there was a guy who was in the previous administration who liked to use, liked to use that term, the little things. Um, and eventually found out he was taking the money in little bits from all the agencies under him. So that was the, those were the little things he was talking about. But the basic things I'm talking about for people fixing the streets in their community, ensuring that they have access to water, ensuring, you know, the children were out of school for so long, ensuring that education is delivered to them. And we're talking about education, we can talk about the Because We Care cash grant, putting $3.2 billion in the hands of parents of children in public school. So the list is extremely long of the interventions. And that is why you're hearing sentiments from people that what they have seen in 12 months they haven't seen in five years on the apno afc and people are people are, are overwhelmed i think they're taken by surprise in many cases and 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 in, in 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 other cases many people knew having looked at the track record of the people's progressive party citizen government as a party that is always ha, always has an, a hands-on approach to governance to the economics of the country and to the well-being and, and the needs of the people. So we have seen tremendous benefits 
uh, going to the people of this country. But you touched on something, says that I want to raise up for us to have a little bit more of a discussion on. And you talk about the issue of the pandemic. And I believe the response from this government has been tremendous. It has been so appropriate. I mean, we're leading the Caribbean. We're one of the countries or, or the lead country in the Caribbean where there is adequate vaccines, at least the first dose in many instances, for the adult population of this country. And deliberate efforts are being made, led by His Excellency, to procure uh, COVID-19 vaccines that could be administered to children so that there is, there is proper protection of the citizens of this country. But you're seeing daily the anti-vaxxers, those with their political agenda, attempting to pour cold water, attempting to derail this process. And like I said before, and I'll say again, sadly, the people who are doing that are people who have already taken their vaccines. So all, of, all the people who are calling you out to Coffee Square to tell you, come, let's protest, don't take the vaccine, are people who have already taken their vaccines. And they're talking of accusing the government of, of draconian measures and all sorts of things. I want to share this quickly. I want to share this quickly with um, our, our, our viewers and listeners, says, and I know you may want to, to pop in after this, but I want to share the first um, the first order that was issued on the, on, on the, the, the COVID-19 measures by David Granger's president, where he gave powers to Volna Lawrence using a 1930 something or 1913 law. And among the measures then, measure C says, so the Minister of Public Health shall take measures to you know, remove, disinfect, and destroy the personal effects, goods, buildings, and any other article, material, or thing exposed to infection from the disease. And then you went on to D, which talks about speedily bury or cremate the dead. I wanted to spend some time on those two um, says, because you know why? That was the knee-jerk reaction that you had from, from the David Granger administration dealing with the pandemic. So they were talking about destroying your buildings, you know, destroying your personal effects. Just Eddie, because somebody you had COVID-19. Eddie, what was the date of that order? I don't know the document in front of the you. The 16th the date of it. March 2020. Well, you are looking at it and juxtaposing it to the current orders that are prevailing and the reaction to those current orders. I want to put another fly into the ointment and to remind you of the prevailing circumstances in our country at that time. The day when that order was made, it was the day that the it was the day that the recount exercise as brokered by Her Excellency by Maya Motley, President, Prime Minister of Barbados, was scheduled to start. That is the day that you had five persons assembled by, by the said Prime Minister Motley waiting in this country and being frustrated and being frustrated by the actions of a select few in the Elections Commission to buy time to file that first court action to scuttle that recount process. And we are seeing a lot, a lot of information that is coming out now about who was against and who was for that process and who, who castigated then President Granger for agreeing to that recount. We were seeing the chickens are coming home to roost, you know, Eddie. And while you may look at that order in a particular circumstance, I will invite you and the viewing public to look at that order and circumstance it in the period when it was made. I believe then, and I believe now, that the intention was to misuse that order. And, and you recall, 
There were many threats on many occasions to use COVID, and there were several th attempts as well to use the COVID pandemic to stymie the recount process, to stymie the electoral process, and to therefore frustrate the eventual outcome of the electoral process. Recall that. Recall as well. Recall as well on that fateful Monday afternoon, on that very day, that very day, the 16th of March, 2020, when that order was made, when there were observers, party officials, the persons from CARICOM, uh, commissioners, everyone, waiting at the Artichon Conference Center for that process to start, and they chose to fumigate the building. You recall that? By the Vector Control Department of the Ministry of Health, there, there, by, there at that time under the command of Valda Lawrence, do you recall that, Eddie? Yes, I do. So when Sorry. you see, when you see that order, it was not made by accident. The draconian nature of that order was not by accident. It was, I believe, and I, I, I hold that a very firm view, that it was intended to be misused when necessary. But thankfully, thankfully, the kind of support, the kind of, uh, the way that we stood up, against their draconian and, and, and authoritarian rule and dealt with those issues, I believe it filed their attempt to use that. I, 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 also, I also, when I'm, as I'm discussing this, only the other day, I think yesterday, if, I might, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, a colleague of mine was reminding me when they, when they accused uh, the Timothy Jonas of the Union United Ghana Party of being suspected of having uh, COVID and thereby banning him from the recount center. Do you recall the shenanigans that played out around that? Yep. <laughs> so you understand when I say all of these things have a specific place. They are part of that greater puzzle that they thought that they had in place to rig the system, to rig it. So this was okay. just one of the puzzles. So when you hear today, when you hear today, and you know you made a very good point, Teddy, the persons who are advocating against vaccines and engaging in the whisper campaigns in the communities that persons should not be vaccinated, now, let me say this, and I, I, I believe I'm saying this from a point of fairness as well. There are persons who legitimately may have issues that prevent them from being vaccinated. And, and those persons, I believe, ought to be treated specially. But then you have people, you have people who have utterly no excuse for not taking their vaccines. Absolutely no excuse. And then you have those persons sitting there and then complaining, right? Victims of that very whisper campaign, perpetuated and pervaded by persons who have already been fully vaccinated and publicly stated that they have been vaccinated. Now, if that is not hypocrisy and disingenuity, then I don't know what it is. And that does not only affect, that does not only affect the, uh, the vaccination campaign. You heard the whisper campaign about people being told uh, to shy away from the, because we care uh, cash grants for school age children in the public sector, in public schools. You had people being told in the earlies uh, to be careful about the COVID uh, relief. You recall that, Eddie? So you are advocating that the people who support you, the people who are giving you, the few people who are giving you the time of day to listen to your view, instead of ensuring that they benefit as part of the greater collective of this country, you are ensuring that they are deprived of the services of, of the of the benefit of the state designed to improve their lives what kind of what kind of irresponsible behavior is that 
and then and then you dare tell people that you care about them that that is not caring that that is probably the strangest kind of toxicity that 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 is known to man you know but say and that's the thing the, the pnc and you know are accustomed to practice politics of hate that is what they are doing but they have become so toxic the, the, the hate has poisoned them so much that they have now turned to practice this politics of hate on their own supporters thinking somehow that by encouraging them not to take the vaccine by encouraging them not uh to to, to benefit from the the, the covet cash grant or the, the the um the school children cash grant somehow they are of the view that will affect the ppp or will affect the government it will affect the ppp or the government because we want to see everybody benefit and we want to see every citizen of this country safe in that sense but by doing that as a political part these are the very people who allowed you to be in parliament at least i mean had they turned their backs on the pnc they wouldn't have been in parliament they gave you their votes and they got you into parliament they expect you to represent their best interests important here they expect the pnc or the ap and uafc to represent their best interest in the national assembly and to represent their best interest generally but you are busy telling them you're busy advocating that they should not be vaccinated so if they got if they, they contract covid god forbid then they have to battle that by themselves you're telling them in these tough times because of COVID and the difficulties people are facing, not to take or to participate in the cash grant or, 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 or the COVID relief. Supporters of APNU AFC need to, to take a step back. And ask yourselves, are these people really looking out for your interest? You need to ask yourself that question. Because for me, if I am part of an opposition says, I would have gone to parliament and I would have been saying to the PPP, the government of the day, that look, why can't it be $50,000 so that we put more money in the hands of the people? Or why can't it be $200,000? Whatever figure you want to use, the point I am making, you're supposed to have the opposition should have been fighting for greater and more benefits for your supporters and the people of this country but what you are doing is to be vindictive to practice politics of hate politics of division and that is what the pnc because this is no longer apnu and the afc and all this nonsense i think we have moved far away from those cloaks it is downright dirty pnc that we are seeing it is the downright dirty PNC that practices hate, lies, misinformation, division, violence. That is what we are seeing. And that is where they are heading. And like you rightly said, says, and I mentioned earlier, the conduct of the opposition is downright criminal because they took their vaccines, protect themselves, and Dr. Ramsami made it right on this program, he made the point that many of them called him and asked that if they can bend the rules when it was 60 years and above so that their relatives and their friends and their loved ones can benefit from the vaccines. But now they're telling you who have your, your ill grandmother or something at home not to take the vaccine. I want to move quickly, says, uh, to another issue. And that has to do with Recently, the Minister of Local Government made some, some, some public statements. And I think the President made similar statements, the Vice President as well made similar statements with regards to the local government elections coming up and whether or not any right thinking Guyanese will want to see another elections in this country with the GCOM Secretariat or with the current construct 
of the GCOM Secretariat or with the current players in the GCOM Secretariat? Says, I know the government nominated commissioners have been trying their level best to ensure that the situation at the Ghana Elections Commission is fixed and that we have people that we remove the criminal elements from there and that we have people of integrity through whatever process is used replace them so that the elections in the future can be can be credible well the, the declaration of results and at least there are there aren't people in the system who may want to manipulate the system in the favor of any political party says i know again today efforts by the pnc to frustrate the system continue i'll give you a chance to maybe explain to our citizens so they understand what has been taking place Eddie, let me start from the point that you have started at. You have, uh, you have enumerated a virtual laundry list of persons in government who have publicly stated that it is their respected opinion, respectful opinion, that we ought not to go to not any other election with the current construct of GCOM and vis-a-vis -vis the uh, employees. Uh, what you have neglected to say is that I myself I have joined that chorus a very long time ago uh, because it is something that I, uh, I firmly believe. Now, let me say this. Stripped of its esoteric content uh, as to what which we all know occurred at GCOM. Acceptance of the results by all of the stakeholders is a function of the comfort and confidence that those stakeholders have in the process, that the process will be free, fair, and free from fear. What we have seen, particularly emanating from GCOM, immediately preceding the 2020 elections and for those long arduous months immediately following it, is that it was an uphill battle to ensure that those particular elements of fairness and transparency attended to the elections. So from that outset, I think we owe it to the Guyanese populace and all of the stakeholders in the electoral process to ensure that some degree of respectability and integrity is reinstated into that organization. In that regard, what myself and fellow commissioners have done, Bibi Shadik and Manoj Narayan, was to move three motions to which sought the dismissal of the, those persons, Keith Lowenfield, Roxanne Myers, and Claremont Mingo, whose actions were a matter of public notoriety and which was on display for all the world to see. Those motions in themselves detailed all the grounds upon which we sought their summary dismissal from the commission, from the employee of the commission. Subsequent to the, uh, subsequent to the, subsequent to the filing of those motions, as is also public knowledge, Keith Lowenfield moved to the courts to seek an order preventing myself as mover of the motion and Bibi Shadik, a seconder of the motion, from participating in the deliberation on those motions. Subsequent to that, and I'm, I'm, I'm attempting as best as possible to provide a chronology of events in this saga. Subsequent to that, what you had was a an amendment to the motion because at the time that we moved those motions 
we did not have the benefit of the contracts of those employees. So subsequent to the movement, uh, moving of those motions, we applied, uh, we, we, we moved an amendment to those motions to have those employees terminated pursuant to the terms of their contract with notice. Based on that, uh, there was an amendment placed before the commission. Subsequent to that, Mr. Lowenfield, I'm sure based on legal advice, withdrew his challenge to the court, thereby paving the way for the motions to be debated upon, to be debated and voted upon. That was set for today. But mind you, mind you, prior to this, you had a submission, suggestion, whatever you want to call it, from the other side, that the inquiry into the actions of these persons should be done by an independent tribunal. This was stoutly defended and opposed by uh, commissioners on our side because it is our considered opinion as well that the that the commission is the only place is the only place and, and is the only body tribunal tasked constitutionally with the authority to conduct such an inquiry. And I hasten to add, you, Edward Lane, or nobody in this country could bring a complaint to the commission. It's not set up that way. It is set up. It is set up that a, a member of the commission must bring that complaint to the commission. There is no law that allows a motion to be tabled before the commission except by a member of the commission. This is always the case. Anyhow, that being said, the, the, uh, the chairman ruled that the position is that the uh, inquiry will be done, the discussions on the motion will be done by the commissioners themselves. At some point in this time, in this process, Alexander and company decided that they did not want to participate in the process and they walked out. That was a couple of weeks ago. We had several uh, other delaying mechanisms and we came to today. Armed with all of the information about the withdrawal of the proceedings by Low and Field, the amended motions and everything. It was delay after delay after delay. You, you could see, you could see by their body language, you could see, you could see by their posture that they did not want to participate in this process. It came to a point, it came to a point where uh, the discussions were had on the on the motion, and they they were attempting to focus more on form rather than substance. And you see, sometimes you have to circumstance this, just like I was asking you earlier on to circumstance the, uh, the, the order of the first grade order, COVID order uh, that, that you referenced. You have to circumstance this, you know. These persons who these motions are moved against must take some considerable comfort in the fact that the persons in the in the form of Alexander, Corbin, and Trotman have never publicly condemned or have never in any way, shape, or form, to my knowledge, condemned their actions. And to me, that lack of condemnation can suggest a condemnation of their actions. And when we see this, when we see this 
tacit support and resistance to the motions to remove these persons whose shenanigans were on display for the world to see. It, it, it only lends to that belief of condemnation of those actions. So after all was said and done today, and, and, and what, what was the basis of contention today? The move is now to terminate these persons with notice. They will be given subsequent to their contract. They will be paid for that notice. And 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 you know, it's an age-old, it's an age-old uh, it is an age-old established concept and principle of law that you cannot foist a willing employee on an unwilling employer. And it is clear, it is clear, and I'm using the words of my colleagues, uh, my colleague, Commissioner Manoj Narayan, as he said in the meeting today, it is clear that the relationship between these persons and GCOM has become untenable. And yet, you have these persons who are there. And what do they want? We are moving to the position to terminate based on the contract. What does the other side seem to want? They want this termination to have absolutely no reference whatsoever to the contents of the motion and the shenanigans of these persons which in, which in the first place caused these motions to become necessary. They don't want that. So on the face of it, it we probably are mad. And we are pulling this out of the, 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 the clear blue sky that these innocent persons we are trying to we are trying to remove. But that far be it from the case. Had they not had they not conducted themselves in this manner, then these actions would not have become necessary. So, Eddie, I believe sometimes I have to cast myself in a, in a sense of delusion and insanity to understand the psyche of these persons and to perhaps find some sort of justification for their way of thinking. Because without that, it will not make no sense. It will make no sense. But that seems to be the order of the day and that is where we are. Thankfully, and of course they walked out. They walked out. Uh, thereby scuttling the meeting. But there is hope on the horizon, as is catered for in the Constitution in relation to quorum. And thankfully, thankfully, GCOM is one of those very few organizations, very few organizations which has its quorum set in the Constitution. Article 226 of the constitution speaks of what the quorum is in GCOM. And if there is a lack of quorum, what happens? In this instance, in, a, in light of the lack of quorum, thankfully, the chairman has adjourned the meeting as is provided for in the constitution to, two, to no later than two days. So on Thursday at one o'clock, there is going to be another meeting. And at that meeting, a quorum consists of any four commissioners, inclusive of the chairman. So a meeting is going to happen on Thursday. And it is my hope that the anguish that this nation has continued to suffer at the hands of these persons will soon come to an end. And you know, you know, says you spoke about in essence, this world, not just Guyana, but this world view clearly the actions of Lowenfield, Myers, 
and Mingo. Over that period, well, Mingo in, in the initial stages, he started a dirty game and then you had Lowenfield and Myers continued up until almost uh, the 1st of, 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 of August. But what they want now is an, what they're doing now is really an attempt to rewrite history. They want to take a brush and just paint their crimes away. It's not going to happen. And I agree with you. It's not going to happen. Whether or not GCOM, and I'm saying this with the greatest of respect, says, whether or not GCOM at its meeting, the commission of it at its meeting, decide to either dismiss them based on the crime they committed or dismiss them without reference to the crime that they which they committed the reality is the people of guyana and the world over fully aware of the crimes that they committed and know what they did we all know what they did so whether or not it's written in their in their dismissal letters the reality is we know and i'm happy that you you report to us that there is going to be a meeting on Thursday, and I believe I, I have I have every reason to believe that Thursday is D Day, if you want, where GCOM, the Commission, is going to make a decision that will rid that body, that that agency that has such a significant responsibility in managing our elections of those elements, who this nation no longer have any trust in. Say so I'm going to give you a chance uh, for your closing comments as we wrap up. Eddie, there are so many things that I would love to touch on, um, but usually, as usual, uh, time does not permit. But like I said, it is unfortunate that every time we come here, we have to be discussing this sore issue. And it is unfortunate that the persons who are looking at this, the persons who are tasked with the responsibility of ensuring that policies and, and, and legislation, etc., are are dealt with from a higher level and you're talking about commissioners on GCOB, you're talking about parliamentarians, you're talking about all of these people. You have one bunch of people like ourselves who are trying to ensure that the citizens enjoy a better quality of life and on the other hand you have a bunch of people who are hell-bent on making people's lives miserable. And, you know, I keep saying this as well, and sometimes I'm fed up of saying it, that don't think people are blind. The Honorable Attorney General last evening said, uh, said in, the, in the National Assembly, and I, uh, in fact, <coughs> excuse me, posted a snippet of that on um, my WhatsApp status this morning. People are not stupid. The Guyanese public is not stupid. And that is the last thing that I'll say this evening. We recognize that. We recognize that. And I would hope that more people will take heed of the intelligence of the Guyanese people and don't try to insult it. Thank you very much, Cease. Uh, I think that's a quite apt way to, to end this program this evening. Um, and I want to thank you for being part of this program, uh, to share information with the public. Um, you know, what is happening at GCOM and generally what is happening in our country. We continue on this side uh, in, in government to, to spare no effort in ensuring that we better the lives of the people of Guyana. And I want to say this is in, in, in closing that the, the train of development has left the station. Sadly, the, the opposition seems to be still standing at the station. But they have a chance to catch up and get on board. If not, history, history is going to judge them for what they are. Obstructionists who have personal interest as their priority and care absolutely nothing about the people of this country. Say this again, I want to thank you for being here. And to our viewers and listeners, we want to say thanks for being part of the program.